ensure that more people are, you know, are equipped with the needed skill to, you know, to improve themselves and also, you know, help with um, national growth. So my name is Ijama Thomas Odia. I'm a print journalist and I work presently with The Guardian Nigeria. So um, I don't know if you've had the opening prayer like is stated in the program. Uh, not really. I was waiting for you, so I welcome them. So I think we should proceed from there. Okay. So I'll just I'll just read a bit about uh, about the director general of NATIB. Yeah. So she's next. Okay. So Dr. Fatima Fatima Waziri as. She's Director General of the National Agency for Prohibition of Trafficking in Persons. Fatima got her first degree in law from the prestigious Faculty of Law at Madibelo University, Zaria, in 2001. She was a senior special assistant to the President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria on rule of law since August 2019, before her new appointment. The distinguished Abusite is well, well grounded in her field and has acquired several certifications, including a bachelor's of law, master's in law, and a doctorate in law. She's an associate member, Chartered Institute of Administrators in the UK, member Nigerian Bar Association, MBA, member New York County Lawyers Association, member Association of Women in Development, member women in international security. Mrs. Fatima is an associate professor and former head of department of public law at the Nigerian Institute of Advanced Legal Studies. She has vast working experiences both in Nigeria and abroad and is an expert in rule of law and advocates against domestic and sexual violence, including trainings and research. I welcome Dr. Waziri Aze. She here. Thank you, Gemma. I'm here. Oh, oh. thank so you. Good to you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for that. Happy International Women's Day. Yes, yeah, same here, Ma. Happy International Women's Day. Yes. So do I have the floor? Yes, please. Please. All right. Wow. All okay. right, I'm Faith. Thank you, thank you for doing this. Thank you for putting this together. So it gives me great pleasure to be in your midst today, to share my thoughts and convictions on the concept of empowering women for nation building. Mm -hmm. My sincere appreciation to the organizers of this event for this opportunity to deliver this keynote. The choice of the theme, fashion, women empowerment and nation building, I must say is an inspired one because it underscores the importance of the fashion sector to women empowerment and nation building, a sector that is usually underestimated. Fashion has the incredible power to elevate the lives of women, to give them both an income and a voice. Your style depicts your voice and projects who you are. Fashion has become a way through which women are representing what they feel. In particular, it allows women to express who they are and what they like, as well as their place in society. The potential of the, of the fashion sector to create jobs along value chain, add value to raw materials, the immersed creativity and art that comes to bear, and the ability to bridge geographical boundaries is limitless. Our thinking on these issues must continue to be dynamic and versatile. And we all have an opportunity here to be a deliberate participant in an incredible supply chain, connecting directly to artisans whose work is deeply rooted in tradition and whose business supports thousands of families across board. Having said that, I shall be focusing on the topic, empowering women for nation building. In 1995, the United Nations reported 
in no society today do women enjoy the same opportunities as men. 27 years later, gender inequality continues to be one of the most notable human rights violations within all societies. Moves to ensure the eradication of gender biases and place women on an equal opportunity pedestal as their main counterparts have gained popularity globally since it began decades ago. The notion speaks to the promotion of the sense of self-worth and enhancement of the ability to choose while protecting women's rights to influence social change for themselves. In the past, women were said to lack intellectual capacity and emotional fortitude to make difficult decisions that leadership positions required. With words spoken and actions taken, they were regarded as incapable of providing for the family as the visible breadwinner. Yet, women continue to make excellent decisions regarding the re related to struggling to feed and educate their children or wards. They serve as food gatherers and processors in Asian societies and provided substantial portions of farm labor in traditional institutions. Learned social constructs backed by religious sentiments often expressed in phrases like, women should be seen, not heard, were predominantly utilized to keep persons of the female gender in check and relegated to domestic and reproductive roles with the glaring absence of appropriate recognition and compensation for works done prim primarily in informal setting. Even though studies show that progress has been made to eliminate gender inequality around the world through enhanced legislation, law reforms, political commitment, and gender sensitive strategies, in many countries, these efforts have not really affected the lives of women and girls as discrimination against them remain endemic. Allow me to share some empirical data. So the 2019 UN Women's Multi-Stakeholder Strategy for Accelerated Action for Women and Girls by 2030 highlights some restrictions on women's rights globally. The report states that too many sex discriminatory laws remain in force and that 104 countries have laws that prevent women from working in specific jobs. 59 countries have no laws on sexual harassment in the workplace. 18 countries have laws that allow husbands to legally permit their wives, to legally prevent, rather, to legally prevent their wives from working. And about 40% of the countries have at least one constraint on women's property rights. A 2020 United Nations Development Program Gender Social Norms Index report reveals that in spite of decades of pro progress in closing the gender equality gaps, close to nine out of 10 men and women around the world hold some sort of bias against women. The report measures how social beliefs obstruct gender inequality in areas like politics, work, and education, and contains data from 75 countries covering about 80% of the world's population. According to the report, almost half of those polled that men are superior political leaders, while over 40% believe that they make better business executive and are more entitled to jobs when the economy is lacking. More so, 25% think it is justified for a man to beat his wife. Out of the 75 countries surveyed, only six showed that most people hold no bias towards women. There are no countries in the world with gender equality, this, this study found. Globally, close to 50% of men said they have more rights to a job than women, and over 40% feel that gender equality and the empowerment of women are central all over. We know that when women and girls are empowered, better development outcomes. It really remains a critical former signpost in the journey to women's empowerment. The conference building, the conference building on past events, aided the clear articulation of the barriers for stalling the advancement of women. It identified a range of actions that national and international stakeholders 
including government and civil society groups, should take to respect women's human rights to a gender balanced environment. Training, raising awareness, building self-confidence, providing the necessary space for women to thrive through expanded choices and increased access to and control over resources we identified as essential tools for empowering women and girls to claim their rights. It has been proven, especially in the global scene, that empowering women in the economy and closing gender gaps in the, in the world of work are key to contemporary global and national development. Women in both developed and developing economies are identified as being engaged in various activities that improve the financial state of their families, stimulate economic growth, as well as the nation's development. Studies have shown in the context of company management that companies with the highest representation of women on their top management teams experience better financial performance than companies with the lowest women's representation. Bringing the discourse closer home, according to a 2018 study, women with the highest rate of entrepreneurial activities in Nigeria. This percentage of entrepreneurial contributes fundamentally to developing the Nigerian economy. And logically so, women make up about half of the Nigerian population. So when more women work in formal sectors like the fashion sector, rather than in informal settings that are not compensated, the economy is bound to grow. It is no wonder that the 2030 Agenda on Sustainable Development features prominently the need to empower women with Goal 5 on gender equality, Goal 8, promoting full and productive employment and decent work for all, Goal 1 on ending poverty, Goal 2 on food security, Goal three on ensuring health and goal 10 on reducing inequalities. Now the Nigerian government has over the years not relented in its commitment to creating an enabling environment for women to influence social change and economic development. A clear example is the revised gender policy 2021 to 2026 that was recently approved by the Federal Executive Council on March 3rd, 2022. Similarly, the government successfully championed the development of MSMEs to create jobs and drive inclusive growth while also promoting the integration of Nigerian-based businesses into regional and global value chains. In 2021, the Federal Ministry of Women's Affairs launched the gender initiative of the Commodities and Export Department to use available resources to support women to realize their potentials in the commodities and export trade subsector. To provide some specificity, from 2015, government has ensured that government social and entrepreneurial programs have an affirmative component for women. Of the 2.4 million beneficiaries of the government enterprise and empowerment program, 1.2 million were women. A total of 38 billion in loans have been disbursed over the last four years. Of the 1.1 million beneficiaries of the conditional cash transfers, 1.78 million are women, over 98% of the beneficiaries. For the Youth Empowerment Program, Empower, of the 526,000 employed, 40.4% are female. And of the 106,074 cooks in the homegrown school feeding program, 97% are female. Government implemented a payroll support program, which was designed to mitigate income loss in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. And of the 300 and 307,170 three employees, that have benefited 130,880 are female owned businesses. Of the 94,300 
and 18 artisan beneficiaries of the program, over 40,000 are female artisans. And so far, 35% of the grants to MSMEs have gone to female MSME owners. Even with this positive development, women's empowerment in Nigeria remains challenged in several respects. These challenges include, but are not limited to female facing the risk of violence and sexual harassment in, in public and workplaces, gender stereotypes that disproportionately relegate responsibility for household caregiving to women, and inadequate training and education to compete for good jobs or access global markets. In predominantly patrilineal or rented environment, the topic of gender inequality and gender biases is treated with a certain level of circumspection. It is often viewed as negating the tenets of a higher or predetermined order. Hence in Nigeria, even with ongoing advocacy for proper gender inclusion and reorientations, the trends remain broadly skewed towards men. On March 1st, 2022, Nigerian women suffered another blow when all the proposed bills to the constitutional amendment concerning women were thrown out. Despite extensive back-end work, lobbying, sensitization, consultation, negotiation, and advocacy. Of the 68 bills proposed for amending different provisions of the 1999 constitution, four were directly related to gender equality covering provisions of 15% affirmation in political party administration, special seats for women in state houses of assembly, 20% minimum percentage in ministerial and commissioner, and commissioner nominees, and they all failed to pass. Regret, regrettably, the ongoing pandemic has left a disproportionate impact on female entrepreneurs further pulling down progress gain. Women make up a significant number of the small and medium enterprises, a sector hit, hit hardest by the economic downturn and the attendant containment measures. In addition, mounting pressures of childcare and family responsibilities during the pandemic have left women particularly vulnerable economically and psychologically. Don't get me wrong, it is not my intention to downplay the progress made so far, but to help us focus on what more we can do as a nation to create and operate a gender neutral environment. How can we dislodge stereotypes, stereotype conclusions that women are less capable of leading? An important step is a cooperation between public and private sectors to accelerate efforts to dismantle the structural obstacles and biases that impede female entrepreneurship and empowerment. The fact that gender is still treated as an afterthought in the design and implementation of laws and policies in some sectors need to be addressed through gender mainstreaming. Gender and women empowerment should be treated at all times in the broader context. This way, assessing the, impl the implications of any policy plan of action for both men and women becomes an integral part of any program, design, implementation, monitoring, and evaluation. Dismantling the structural obstacles and biases that impede female entrepreneurship and empowerment requires the cooperation of all sector actors. Women should be seen and heard if they desire to be heard. And this begs the question, how can more women be involved in governance? Notably, operating within, within the sphere of social change and influence is a significant step for women. Globally, women are underrepresented in decision-making, not only in political sphere, but also within the private sector, at the village level, and in civil society organizations. This low participation is due to social norms, which detects domestic roles and often leave women with limited time. Leadership and participation, especially in the political sphere, is often viewed as an area where men have superior knowledge. We need to cultivate the corresponding desire 
to affirmatively occupy the decision-making positions and let our voice count in determining the political and social economic direction of the polity. When you are given a place at the table, please use it. And to achieve this, we must unlock and increase access to all level of education for women. This is of paramount importance. Educating girls is key to women empowerment. Not only does it need to lead to higher literacy, but what's, but what's more is that education is the gift that keeps giving. As girls are educated mothers, as girls of educated mothers are two times likely to attend schools themselves. And women who are educated are less likely to be poor. We need to encourage more women to get into politics. And this includes training women for political candidacy, providing funding or capacity building on fundraising for women candidates, and including women as election monitors. Mobilizing with female voters is also considered important to get women elected into office and to deepen democracy. Women must also ensure that only women who are efficient and have the capacity to lead are encouraged to contend for positions. Stronger, stronger recognition of women's issues in policy, in policy can only be achieved through increased representation of women in national and state governance. Take for instance, to promote greater economic in inclusion of women and increase female participation in corporate governance bodies. A few countries have enacted laws mandating women's participation in top managerial positions in an audacious move that only a few countries like France, Norway, Italy, Belgium have adopted such laws. In 2021, Morocco did the same, making it the first country in the Middle East and North Africa region to do so. The reform is expected to build confidence in women's qualification, promote their career de development, and stimulate economic growth and business performance. Nigeria should begin to think along these lines. Let me end by saying to all women, and I say with every sense of the word, never be afraid to learn, never be scared to take the requisite steps to do more. It is in um, attempting that barriers are broken. No matter your calling in life, this principle is absolute. Opportunity comes to the prepared. That means every experience in life has potential value. Be ready for when the time and opportunity comes. And it is not enough to simply get prepared. You must stay prepared. Knowledge mutates every barest fraction of a second. And unless you keep growing, you will end up with outdated skills that don't match the challenges of the world you live in. And here is another thing. Preparation doesn't start with what you do. It starts with what you believe. When you believe that tomorrow's success depends on today's preparation, you receive today differently. The fashion industry has a key role to play. You must have a powerful, you can have a powerful impact by partnering to extend and support women's entrepreneurship and help women move up the value chain to fuel inclusive and sustainable businesses, economies, and societies. Women need to support women. We need to be each other's fiercest cheerleaders. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you so much for this powerful, <laughs> If it was if it was a fiscal event, we'd have all been we are all stood up. <laughs> a wonderful class. thank you so much. Thank you, Jeff. Insightful. We had a lot of information, a lot of data. Thank you so much. Thank you so okay. much. I hope you hear some of these so that we can also put it out there in the media. Thank you so much, Dr. Waziri. Thank you for, you know, telling us so much about empowering women, you know, for nation building. We appreciate you. Okay, so quickly, because of time, I'll be calling Itoro. She'll be speaking on gender rights and sustainable development. Itoro Basi is a Nigerian-American writer and storyteller working in broadcast journalism in Nigeria. 
She writes, produce and correspond for the Arise News. Arise News are an Arise America, where she's telling news from an African perspective. Welcome, Itoro. Thank you for having me, everyone. Happy International Women's Day, and I'm, I'm very honored to be here. Thank you, Faith, for thinking of me for um, this gathering. So I just have a few words. I'll keep it brief. Yeah. Um, but I am happy to share this day with you. And if there's anything that I can speak to, it's, of my, um, it's in my capacity as a storyteller. So specifically because we're talking about fashion and how fashion plays into sustainability. I want to first say that I've gotten the pleasure to meet so many women designers who are setting trends and showing the world, specifically the fashion world, that what Nigeria has to offer in terms of its sustainability and its natural rich resources and culture is more than enough. And they're also saying that as women, they, we are more than enough and we can succeed. And specifically with fashion, fashion is a way to tell an important story of a people, of a culture. And specifically for women in Nigeria, fashion is a way to be liberated, to have ownership over our bodies, what we wear, and how we feel. So in that way, we are culture bearers and we are way showers. Um, and I've also gotten to meet a lot of women who are tailors, politicians, women working in the market, caterers, bank agents, whatever they are, they all have this deep desire and longing to self-actualize. And um, I just want to speak from personal experience because I feel like the speech before me spoke a lot to the data, so I don't have to repeat that. So I'll speak to the feelings that many people have as I'm in the field. There's a need to want to be seen, to want to be heard. You know, um, women, wherever there's a woman, there's a way. So we all know that sustainability can be there so long as there are the resources but really giving space for women to be able to process what they've been through um, and what they keep going through, especially when we're talking about the political level, trying to get positions of power, trying to gain access. What does this mean to be a woman in 2022? I think is a key question to ask as we're also talking about sustainability. And I'm thankful that I'm with a bunch of other women who are really trying to define what that question is through fashion, through politics, through whatever avenues we have access to. So happy International Women's Day. I'm really happy to be here. And thank you so much for giving all of us this space. Thank you so much, Itoro. I like that you were brief and straight to the point. Thank you so much. <laughs> and so right now we'll be having our host, Teye, which she's the convener and host for this webinar. So I'm going to read a bit about Teye. Faith K. Afan is a Nigerian fashion designer and chief executive officer of Teye's Couture. Born and raised in just Nigeria to a family of four, she's currently an English major student at the University of Joss. Teye's drive for Designs grew astronomically high when she started designing and sewing for herself and for her siblings and close friends. In early 2016, Tay moved from sewing in her bedroom to an empty room in the house where she started her entrepreneurial adventure with two sewing machines. In the same month, about four ladies showed interest in wanting to learn under her, but only two eventually got enrolled. With the increase in demand for designs and ladies interested in wanting to learn, Thais launched her label, Thais Couture. Thais' desire to educate the public, especially her immediate community about fashion, intensified in early 2019. This gave birth to an online campaign tagged, Do You Know? The aim was to educate those on social media on the tips and information in the fashion industry. The campaign ran for about a year. In September 14, 2019, she organized her first fashion meetup with the team Wall of Fashion in Plateau State, where needs to what needs to change. And the hashtag just fashion meetup out of the desire. 
out of the desire to have an in intense discussion around the fashion industry in Plato Joss, in Plato State. The event had in attendance other fashion designers, photographers, on air personalities, bloggers, models, possible investors, among others. Okay, so we have on the floor, Faye, you're welcome. And she'll be taking us on fashion in empowering women. Thank you so much, Ijama. Thank you so much. Once more, happy International Women's Day to everyone. Every woman is beautiful. Every woman is special. So let's all be happy and enjoy today. Talking about fashion. Fashion is not limited to just women, but we'll talk about the women because we are a special kind. Fashion is a way we express ourselves and it tells a lot about us as women. So therefore empowering a woman, a woman through fashion is something so strong because it reflects a lot about a woman that she wants the world to see. We know how women behave, wherever they do something or they want to express themselves, they obviously want people around them to see or to view. So my mission here as a person or as a brand is to see that I use fashion to empower women because a woman have a lot to bring to the table. So why not give a woman a skill? Because when you give a woman a skill, just as Dr. Fatima said, it passes on to the next generation easily. It passes on to the next generation so fast. So whenever a woman is built, whenever a woman is having a skill or discovers herself, her self-worth, she, she gets self-confidence and she can stand everywhere. Wherever she speaks about herself, she speaks with so much confidence because she knows her what. But just uh, the history, the, the a lot of story that Dr. Fatima told us about uh, previously that a woman cannot speak, she can just be seen, but she cannot be she cannot speak in public. But then we are of the generation now, and it's our aim, it's our role, it is our purpose to see that we change that perspective. It is our aim to see that we change how people, how women are seen. And as women, we are not, we are, we are women and we are working, we are seen outside. So what great pleasure will you give to see that you give a woman a skill? So I am speaking fashion and I am representing fashion. It is really very, a very strong thing to give a woman, to empower a woman through fashion. She becomes independent. She discovers herself what she earned. She learned and she earned. And in the process of earning, she becomes an independent woman where she could buy things and speak in public places. Because we women feel as if we are being deprived of a lot of things when we depend on the men or we depend on the society to speak for us and even to make decisions for us. But here, when a woman has a skill, when a woman has something to do, when a woman learns, she will definitely earn from whatsoever she learns. And then, since the word empowerment is like giving someone power, why not give a woman the power? Why not give a woman the power to learn, to earn, and to become independent of herself? It gives us as women the room to stand out. I, I, I as a person can say even from a personal experience, when you're doing something, when you meet a strong woman, you begin to say, oh, wow, this is my mentor. Why? Because she speaks with so much boldness. She stands out. But... We don't want to see a woman that shy away from the crowd. When you go and discover her background, except the introverts and all those shy people, you discover that she has nothing to speak for herself or rather she's depending on that someone. But when a woman has a skill that she's into it passionately, she's into it and she knows what she's doing. Definitely she's learning from it. And of course she would want to earn from it and become an independent woman. Thank you very much. So that would save time. I won't be saying a lot because Dr. Fatima has given us the history of everything. So I would just want to talk about the fashion and giving a woman a skill for nation building. And that's even creating job opportunities because when she's employed, she has work, she teach others, she, she talk to others and even help others. So of course, it helps in the growth of the nation for development. Thank you, Ijama. It was... It was also insightful to, to, know, to have you talk about your role as an, a fashion entrepreneur and also you know, inspiring and ensuring that all more young people who are drawn to that passion you know, also get empowered 
you know, for their growth. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Fatima Ituro. Thank you so much, Tay. Now we, we are on to questions and answers, the question segment. If there are questions, let me know. Else I'll be the one asking the questions. So is there anyone who wants to ask a question? If not, I could just go ahead and ask. Like, Hello. Hello. I please can. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Okay, I just wanted Dr. Fatima to share some of her reports with us, like some of the reports she she noted. So that offer already so i am hoping that she would oblige us her report okay Did the request thank rather you. thank you dr fatima yes I'll, I'll i'll send my paper to faith i'll email it to faith so she can share okay okay thank you any more questions that was not a question anyway <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? You like to have the statistics as well, Rosa. Okay, so I'm hope I'm I am assuming that the statistics you mean is also Dr. Fatima report. Okay, okay. Say you will email it to everyone. Yeah. Okay. Okay. You have the floor. So someone has a question. I I thought maybe I would just ask um my voice if that's okay. Okay. So I wanted that's to right. ask each of the first of all, let me say thank you for each of the guest speakers. It was a very interesting um, webinar and I learned a lot. I wanted to ask each of them, each of the ladies, if you can share maybe one experience you've had that might've been negative, maybe from your workplace or in relation to fashion. Um, maybe Tay, you can say something about your business and if you've been, if people sort of, you know, don't want to take, you know, a fashion entrepreneur seriously enough in certain, in certain areas. I'd love to hear if you've had any direct experiences. Thank you. Okay. So who would like to go first? Put my, is my video there? Uh, well, for me, uh, I'm not into fashion, so I don't know if that applies to me. Maybe Faith might want to answer, answer that. Just to, well, my background, I have a legal background. I'm an academic. And of course, we all know lawyers. I've had my fair share of years of wearing boring outfits. So when I joined um, the presidency, I decided to switch it up a bit. So, so right now, all my pantsuits, my skirt suits have been locked away. I wear strictly Ankara and Adire. And, you know, I've had people say, oh, wow, I like your style. So more people now wear Ankara and Adire. So that's just about the closest fashion story I have to share, you know. So maybe Faith might want to say something. Okay, so I guess she also means, um, you know, negative experience being being a woman, you know, practicing. Okay, okay for for me, being a woman, it's 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 tough. We all know it's tough. And um, growing up, I always knew that as a woman, you need to work twice as hard as a man and you need to always distinguish yourself, which was why I knew that. And luckily for me, I come from a background, I come from a privileged background, you know, with parents being able to support you to go to school, school, school. I'm the youngest of five and, you know, all my siblings, everyone, we, we grew up in a home where you must go to school, you must focus. That was what we constantly heard from our parents. 
So even when I traveled to the States to get a second degree, I knew that I didn't want to stop there. I knew I had to go farther, which I got a second degree, I got a master's, I got a PhD. And even at that, you know, coming back to Nigeria, you constantly have to prove yourself. I found myself in a room, or let me share this very, very recent um, experience. So we had a meeting at the, um, the first headquarters. We were working on police reform. We were sitting on the, the boardroom table. Out of 10 people, I was the only woman there. Now this um, assistant, I think it's an assistant commissioner of police came and was, and was you know, distributing reports from the previous meeting. That was the first time I was actually attending the meeting. So he didn't know who I was. I came into the meeting with colleagues. Then I was still senior special assistant to the president of rule of law in the office of the vice president. So I came in, in with colleagues. So I don't know what he was thinking. He was standing right beside me and he was distributing um, reports. And he kept going over my head and he gave this person, gave this person, gave this person. And I was sitting down there, I was fuming. Before I could say anything, and one of my colleagues who is a retired AIG and also you know, a, a, an aide to the president now said, ah, see her sitting down there, give her now. Then he turns and looks at me and gives me. Then I was like, what the heck? At that point, I, I flipped. I was like, what the heck? I said, anyway, the way you treat women is a reflection of how you treat your wife in the house. Then everybody just kept quiet. So when the meeting started, we all had an opportunity to introduce ourselves. But of course, I introduced myself, Dr. Fatima Waziri as a senior special assistant to the president. And the next thing, you know, you could see. And I'm like, I don't have to be somebody for you to give me that respect. And for the fact that there are 10 people sitting here and I'm the only woman, and you treat me like I am nobody, then that is a shame. So after that, he like apologized and all that. And we are now very good friends. So that is just one of the many stories, many. I've had instances as director general of NAPTI. I'll go to a place. I'll be standing with uh, male colleagues and they will ask, who is the director general? Where's, no, they'll ask me, they'll be looking at me and be asking me, where's the, where's the DG? And I'll go, I am the DG. Like, oh, okay. You know, so it's just crazy. It's just crazy. It is, wow, quite interesting. <laughs> so, Itoro, the question was around talking about negative experiences, you know, being a woman and practicing your profession. Do you have anything for us? I do. And thank you, Dr. Fatima, for sharing, because it made me think of all of my stories. But um, I'll keep it brief. Um, yes. So... Being a woman in um, anywhere, but definitely in the news, there's this um, idea that um, a woman should just be in front of the camera and kind of um, read the scripts that are written for her. And she has no ownership over the story she tells. Um, and I'm somebody who loves to be very, very hands-on. So when I first came into the newsroom, and in many ways, I'm also coming in as a foreigner. I was born and raised in the US and I decided to come back to Nigeria. You know, culturally, I was making what I call a lot of faux pas because I really wanted to be in my story so much that I also wanted to edit my story. And that is something traditionally that's kept for the men, at least in my particular work environment. So one day I decided to edit my work because things were going too slow for me and, and I wanted it to go quicker. Uh, and then I brought my edit to the editor. And the first thing he asked me was, who did this for you? And I told him, I was like, I did. And he was just like, are you sure? I was just like, I'm very sure that I did it. And then he had the other editor look at it and he was just like, well, whose is better? And I looked at him and I was like, I tell you, mine is better because it's my story and this is how I want it done. And um, that day, that was a mini battle that I got to win. But, um, you know, as Dr. Fatima said, it's one of many, but I had to definitely learn just to keep, to keep at it, to keep going, even when people are constantly trying to chip 
at um, your person and at what you can do and your ability. So that's one story. And another story I have, because we are talking about fashion, is I wear all Ankara usually when I'm in the office. It's important for me to celebrate and wear the clothes of um, women tailors, specifically women designers. And everyone was surprised that I wasn't wearing jeans and wearing more Western clothes. And I saw how making that simple fashion change actually shifted something in how people perceived me, perceived my work and perceived um, what I was there for. So yeah, yeah, there are tons of stories about being a woman in the workplace. Okay, thank you so much, Itoro. Thank you. So we would have Tay, Tay um, rounding up with, so that um, we can let Dr. Waziri Azi take you know, the final comments and then we wrap it up. Tay, are you there? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Ijeoma. And I'm going to be brief. It's, mine is more like a funny story. It's in the bank and then I'll be just business wise applied for a loan that I'm eligible for, mm. going through the process, going through the process, submitting that I'm using it for a fashion-like event. Uh, was, I applied because I wanted to use it to see how I'll train the little children, especially the less privileged children. But then the, the guy at the bank was not even interested in what I was going to use it for. His interest was fashion. He even asked me, why not look for a man to come and help you process this? Then I was like, why not me? What's wrong with me? I'm a woman, I have a vision. There's something I need to do and this is my goal. But he, he said, who gives a woman money these days? And I was just wondering and his words really gave me a heart attack, but I kept pondering, I kept talking to him, this, this and that. So there was a statement he said that it's easier for a man to walk into the bank, apply for a loan and get it. But it's very difficult for a woman to walk. She would have to beat, beat and beat. And I was like, why a woman? Why a woman? So honestly, in the fashion business, I know it has been hectic, especially when it comes to looking for funds to do this or that. But being a woman in fashion, uh, indeed, it's really tough because you have to like go through an eye of a needle to see that you pull through. Because everywhere a man stands, he stands with his shoulders and feel as if he has his what. And the person a man is talking to will be like, okay, yes, this man knows what he's saying. But except you have a very strong and a very courageous woman standing in to speak for herself or her business is so, so difficult. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Oh, we've had, we've, we've had, you know, really interesting stories and we hope that this will inspire us to always keep pushing because you all have gone through this and you're still standing strong and tall. So we'd like to hear the final words from Dr. Waziri Azi so that we can call it a day. Hello, Dr. Waziri Azi. Yes, yes, I'm here. Yeah, okay. and also for final words, like like you said, you know, women are we've been through a lot. We just have to remain strong, we have to remain resilient, we have to remain focused from anywhere. Just stay prepared. And like I said, we need to be each other's support and um, cheer, cheerleaders. So I, I'm, I'm glad I got to do this, you know. I don't know, I don't know fate from a kind of paint. She just reached out to me on LinkedIn and all that. And I felt, okay, this was, you know, it was, it was a good idea. It was a good concept. And it was something that uh, another woman. And I think if we all adopt this, approach collectively you know we'll, we'll, we'll go a long way the men don't have our backs and happy international women's day again thank you so much dr waziri as in, in fact you 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 made our, our international women's day <laughs> it's, it's what celebrating really and we hope that you know if you have gone through things like this and and you're still standing strong then why not Every woman can do it and, and be better at it. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for our attendees. Thank you, Itoro. Thank you, Tay, for putting this together. And 
I say thank you all for being a part of this. Thank you. Thank you and have a great day. Thank you so much for the, uh, for the attendance. I'm really grateful. Have a lovely day and be a strong woman. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye for now. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Bye.